Now I say this a lot, but how cool is this? This is Lieutenant Zach Farrell. This is Colonel Bill McPherson, the amazing Gene Kranz. You've never seen aerospace like this. During the Korean War, U.S. forces began using helicopters in warfare to a much greater extent. But existing helicopters lacked power and required a lot of maintenance. So the Army held a competition for a new design. In 1955, Bell Helicopter won the competition by building the HU-1A Iroquois, quickly nicknamed the Huey, which was later redesignated the UH-1A. During the Vietnam War, Hueys were uniquely suited to the challenges of fighting in the dense jungles, mountains, seasonal flooding, and a lack of general infrastructure in the country. The versatile Hilo was flown by the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, as well as the Air Forces of many other countries. Nearly 65 years after the Huey's introduction, a few crews are still flying the venerable helicopter, but it has been widely replaced by the UH-60 Blackhawk. Still, Huey pilots have a saying, when the last Blackhawk goes to the boneyard, there will be a Huey crew there to pick them up. Now let's check out some of the features of the UH-1 Huey at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. Now, what you didn't know is this is a Mike model, an M model, which was made specifically as a gunship, which means it's got a kind of an interesting rotor head. It's a 540 rotor head, which gives the, the blades way more play on the left, right, front, and back. That's because these guys carried a ton of ammunition, and you needed to be as maneuverable as possible because 1,400 horsepower sounds like a lot, but when you're carrying rockets and machine gun ammo and a bunch of people, that's not a lot of power. Plus, you got the humidity of Vietnam. That's not good for lift either. All right, people, this is the good stuff. I am here with a real live helicopter pilot who was in Vietnam, and you did how many tours? Three. Three tours. This is Colonel Bill McPherson. Thank you so much for being with us here today. This is a huge honor because, I hate to say it, but I consider you a friend of mine. We'll think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Now, going back to the history of this thing, this guy actually flew in Vietnam. It was built in 1967 by Bell Helicopter in Fort Worth, Texas. So it went directly to Vietnam in 1967 and was issued and assigned to the 1st Battalion, 9th Air Cavalry Regiment, 1st Air Cavalry Division, Air Cavalry Division. <laughs> so No horses, just helicopters. That's right, that's right. And it served for three years. Wow. combat. It has uh, 21 bullet holes to uh, verify its combat time. It was used extensively as support for ground troops who needed gun support. It escorted troop carrying aircraft. It escorted medical evacuation aircraft and was extremely busy for three years, which takes a toll on the mechanics, the turbine, the rotor systems. So at the end of three years, it was shipped back to Bell Helicopter for rebuild in Amarillo, Texas. And as the war was winding down, they decided not to send it back to Vietnam, but issue it to the National Guard. So it was okay. issued to the Nebraska Army National Guard in 1971. And it was in 1996 that it was directed to fly to uh, White Sands to become part of this target drone program. And as, as the program was canceled a few years later, 
it sat there on the airfield until I was able to retrieve it. We'll tell you what, do you want to do a little quick walk around and sure. we can actually take a look at some of these places where it was shot? So what I did to uh, illustrate the bullet holes, I put decals over the holes. So the decals or stickers are on the patch. The patch covers the covers holes. Covers the holes. And you'll find all over the aircraft, there's 21, I believe, 21, 22 on the aircraft Whoa. right now. And in this case, they were going for the pilot because he that sat right correct. there. That is correct. He sat right there. And they didn't get him because the seat for the pilot and the co-pilot are bulletproof Kevlar. Mm -hmm. The same thing the military helmets are right. made of. So wow. uh, he was safe. All right, so we discussed earlier this is a Mike model, which means it was purpose-built to be a gunship. And well, you can see it's loaded for bear. Down here are two M60 flex mount machine guns. That's a 7.62 millimeter machine gun. And they were actually on a mount, two on each side that allowed them to move left and right and up and down. Not a lot, but just enough that you didn't have to really aim the helicopter as much as you would if they were a fixed mount. Now, inboard of the machine guns is something even scarier. Seven shot rocket pod with 2.75 inch folding fin aerial rockets. These guys were monsters. They could carry a high explosive warhead, white phosphorus, or even scarier, this guy, 2200 in each rocket of a flechette. Think of it as a tiny steel arrow. This would just denude the countryside of any vegetation and anybody in it. Super scary. But what's this bad boy right here? It's just a door mounted M60. And the M60 is the same thing that this guy was. This is in the infantry configuration. So if these guys went down, you could literally dismount this weapon and use it to defend yourself from the bad guys. So how much ammunition could these guys actually carry? Well, for example, this box right here will carry 500 belted 7.62 rounds. A lot of guys would carry 80 to 90 of these boxes to feed these behemoths down here. That's a lot of ammunition. But you got to keep in mind, you can't just load yourself down with ammo because you got to keep fuel in mind. And if you got a long mission, you got to have more fuel and less ammo. But if you got a short mission, you can really load up on this and stay on station for quite a bit longer. We are here with Lieutenant Colonel Ken Overturf. Thank you so much for being with us, sir. I'm going to take this thing off my head. <laughs> oh, it's very cool, though. Um, you flew H models and you flew for a project left bank. That's correct. And that was looking for radio signals and... Locating the enemy via radio uh, intercepts. And where were you doing that? Uh, at, uh, at that time, the 1st Cavalry Division, the unit that I, I flew with, uh, was headquartered in Phuc Vinh, uh, Vietnam, uh, in the War Zone C. Uh, right about the middle of South Vietnam. Okay. For our viewers, and especially me, can you take us through kind of what it's like, some tips and tricks on how to fly the Huey? Let's do um, uh, a brief uh, <laughs> helicopter flying 101. Excellent. Uh, three maneuver controls on this helicopter. We'll go through them one at a time. Okay. Starting with the first one is the cyclic, the uh, stick, if you will. Uh, right between your legs. This cyclic provides the uh, horizontal movement in the helicopter. And how it does that is when the rotor head is spinning at its operational RPM of 6,600 revolutions per minute, it becomes like a giant dinner plate. And you can envision this giant dinner plate. Okay. Now, with this cyclic, what you're doing is balancing that giant dinner plate. Tip the cyclic forward the dinner plate tips forward and the aircraft moves forward. Uh, next control is the collective. 
This uh, control gives the your uh, vertical movement capability. Uh, when you're ready to go up, pull the collective up, and it puts pitch in the blades of that spinning plate. Then we go to the third control, which are the anti-torque pedals. The the torque, uh, the power torque caused by the power when you're uh, putting pitch in the blades uh, moves us into Newton's third law of motion. For every action, the rotor head spinning counterclockwise, an equal and opposite reaction, the fuselage would tend to turn um, clockwise. Okay. So to fly this helicopter, all you have to do is balance the dinner plate, manage your vertical and uh, uh, ascent, descent, and keep the nose straight with the pedals all the time. Oh, well that's not hard. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Pleasure. Colonel Bill, Colonel Ken, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Certainly. But guess what? I'm going to go see what has taken the place, but will never replace mm -hmm. the Huey. You got it. And that is the Black Hawk. In the late 1970s, the United States Army started replacing the UH-1 Huey with the UH-60 Black Hawk as their new tactical transport helicopter. Manufactured by Sikorsky Aircraft, modified versions of the Black Hawk have been developed for the U.S. Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard. These have been designated the Sea Hawk for the Navy, Pave Hawk for the Air Force, and Jay Hawk for the Coast Guard. Luckily, we have some friends at the United States Coast Guard, Sector San Diego, who are going to show us the ins and outs of the Jayhawks in their fleet. The origins of this station can be traced back to the 1930s, when the city of San Diego wanted to have a Coast Guard presence, given the increasing maritime traffic. Today, there are over 400 individuals on base, including active duty personnel and civilians. They also have three MH-60T Jayhawks, including one gorgeous yellow one. But right now, we're going to talk to Sector Response Chief and Air Ops Officer, Commander Chris Wright, about the Coast Guard and the work being done by this station. So tell us a little bit about the Coast Guard. What do you guys really do? So the Coast Guard is pretty unique in the fact that we're the, one of the five military branches uh, but we actually are not under the Department of Defense, we're under the Department of Homeland Security. And as one of these five military branches, we actually execute all typical defense military missions if needed, but we actually also transition to 11 statutory missions. So things like search and rescue, homeland security missions, uh, pollution response, oh, wow. even ice breaking, uh, that all falls under the Coast Guard. And what we like to say is we're sort of the protectors of mariners who are in distress. We also protect the homeland against threats that are coming from the sea, and we even protect the sea itself. So, I referred to you as response chief. That means that anything that happens in, in this area, you're gonna be the guy to send out boats, air assets, anything that you have here at the base, is that correct? Yeah, it's kind of a unique position, so I get to do the fun stuff, like when we talk about the helicopter, yeah. we get to fly that and still stand duty, but our three 87-foot patrol boats uh, fall under my you know, operations and tactical control of the sector and I help manage that, uh, as well as our small boat station, which has four uh, small boats that act as tactical pursuit operations, law enforcement, and search and rescues. Can we go do a walk around on the Hilo? Well, I would love to, but I actually have to run and, and deal with some response stuff. So we have an awesome lieutenant who will be able to walk you through all the ins and outs of the helicopter. Does he have a mustache? Because I don't want a lieutenant with a mustache. This is the helicopter I was talking about. This yellow guy, I love this paint scheme. It's not typical and we're gonna find out why, but how cool is this? Now somewhere around here is a pilot that we're gonna talk to. All we gotta do is just kinda wait around for him or so. Hey, oh. you must be Matthew. You must be the mustache. Yeah, that's me. Can't have an aviation show without a mustache. That's right? very true. <laughs> okay, he's not actually called the mustache. Well, maybe he is, I don't know. But this is the Lieutenant Zach Farrell and he's gonna walk us around this helicopter. All right, LT, yeah. let's talk about this paint scheme. What gives? So, the Coast Guard in 1916 had its first flight. Okay. 2016, 
right here on our sweet patch, <laughs> we, uh, we celebrate 100 years of Coast Guard aviation. So earlier Coast Guard aircraft, they flew a yellow paint scheme. It's kind of like how the NFL will do a throwback color. Oh, uh, Coast sweet. Guard's doing the same thing. Very cool. All right, so let's talk about the bird. Where do you want to start? Absolutely. So let's just kind of talk about the MH-60 as a whole. So, okay. so the Coast Guard actually has two helicopters. They've got an MH-65, the Dolphin, and the MH-60 Tango, which is kind of the, the, the special that we're focusing on today. Right. And it's the Jayhawk. So Sikorsky initially built this aircraft because they wanted a combat aircraft. Mm -hmm. So it's very redundant. It's got three hydraulic systems. It has multiple electrical systems. It has multiple fuel lines feeding the engines. Whoa. The idea was you did not want this helicopter to be taken down when it's getting hit with enemy fire. Right. So very redundant. It's designed to fly into a combat zone, take on shots, put troops on the ground, get out. It really gives you kind of a nice feeling knowing that the helicopter is so structurally sound when we're taking it hundreds of miles offshore yeah. Oh, yeah. to affect whatever the mission might be. Let's do a walk around on this guy. Absolutely. Where do you want to start? So let's start over here at the cabin door, and then okay. we'll kind of just make our way around. Yeah, I like it. Literally right above my head yes. are, or is one of the engines. Yes, so one of two. One engine's capable of putting out about 1,800 horsepower. Whoa. Uh, in the event that the pilot needed a little more, we've got a switch that we can hit in the cockpit. It gives us about 200 more horsepower. It burns the engine a little bit, but it's just nice to know that the helicopter has that capability built in in the event that you ever did need more power. So commonly people will ask, oh, is this a bomb or is this a torpedo? No, this is an external fuel tank, and we've got one on this side of the helicopter. If we were to walk around to the other side, there'd be two more. I think these fuel tanks and kind of our range and our capability is one of the things that sets the Coast Guard apart. Mm -hmm. We're capable of putting 6,000 pounds of fuel on this helicopter, which gives us about six flight hours, wow. um, a range of about 600 miles. Theoretically, we'd go 250 to 300 miles offshore. We could hover for about 30 minutes, enact a rescue, and then fly 250 to 300 miles back. What I would say happens even more frequently is we'll get a report of a person overboard or a flare sighting or a mayday, and we have to go and we have to search for these people. The other services, it's my understanding that they use the 60, is kind of like a, we're gonna go from A to B, we're gonna mm -hmm. affect the mission. They don't need as much fuel. With the Coast Guard, any given day, somebody could sound the, uh, the mayday off their radio. It comes to our watch standards, and now we found ourselves in a search that might last us six hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. And this, uh, this helicopter has the capability to go out there, fly that entire search pattern, cover a large expanse of area, searching for whatever individual may be in need. And oftentimes, because we have that capability, it will end in a successful evolution where ideally we've saved somebody's life. That really does set you guys apart. That's impressive. <clears throat> Since we're kind of relating this back to the Huey, one of the big differences is the rotor system itself. So on the Huey, it, it, was, it was a two-blade system. This yep. is a four-blade system. Yes. But there's another difference, and it's in the rotor head somehow? In the rotor head. Yeah, so the, uh, the Huey had, it was a teetering rotor system. And so the, the rotor system would actually kind of teeter back and forth about the mast, and it gave that classic wop, 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 wop yeah. that, that you, you often correlate with, you know, old movies on Vietnam or whatever it Platoon. is. Platoons. <laughs> so the great thing about the 60 is it's got a rigid rotor system, and so basically all the components are about one solid titanium hub, which is connected to the mast, and there's not any play there. So it's just a really solid rotor system. The benefit to that is it takes on various G loads a whole lot more effectively than the old Huey did. And it's just a much more stable platform. And then you mix that in with the stabilization systems that we have built into this helicopter. And this helicopter produces a very smooth ride. Speaking of UH-1s, we were in the cockpit of a, a Huey earlier, an actual Vietnam era um, Huey. That's awesome. I know that the cockpit has got to be different than that thing. Can we go check this one out? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Let's move up to the cockpit. Yeah, yeah. This looks totally different than Huey. Just a little bit. What's going on with all of these screens? So what you're probably used to seeing, what I imagine the Huey at the museum looks like, 
These probably have steam gauges everywhere. Yep. A bunch of switches. Probably not a lot of the electronics that you're seeing here. The good folks at Coast Guard headquarters decided to bring us into the 21st century. <laughs> and so what you've got in front of you is you have five MFDs, multifunctional displays, Whew. and they will display all of our instrumentation. Additionally, we can pull up video systems while we search. We've got a camera underneath the helicopter that can aid in a search. It can pull up infrared imagery to pick up body heat if we're looking for a survivor. Wow. So we can actually control the camera from this joystick here in the oh, center. Oh, no kidding. So either the pilot or the co-pilot can operate. It kind of swivels back and forth. The flight mech in the back or the rescue swimmer, they actually have their own joystick as well, as well as their own screen to where they can operate it and the pilot Whoa. flies. It's all about divvying out tasks in the cockpit to make sure that you're the pilot flying, your primary job is to fly. Mm. If I'm the pilot monitoring or the safety pilot, my primary job is to back you up, to run radios, to make sure that the aircraft's safe. And then we've got a rescue swimmer who can be helping with the videography. We've got the flight mech who can be looking outside the cabin door. It's really like a cohesive team effort to make sure that the mission is done as effectively and as safely as possible. You fly these things. You probably know how to like start this bad boy up. Yeah, I might be able to, I might be able to give a peek. Andy, we good to uh, pull some power? All right, so oh, yeah. as we fire it up, it's a little loud. Yeah. Because there's a lot of electricity that's coming to each of these units. So the screen closest to you, that's your primary flight display. Okay. It gives you your airspeed, heading. your heading, your attitude indicator, altitude. In the center, we like to keep all of our engine instruments so that the pilot can reference. I'm the co-pilot, I can reference. I can pull up a video display. And so right now, you can see your camera guy there in the back. Oh, that's so awesome. I've got him on our camera as he <laughs> has his camera on us. All right, we're halfway there. Can we go fly? You know what? I think we've got something lined up. Oh my God. Yeah, let's go do it. Oh let's yeah, get yeah, yeah, yeah. up yeah. first. All right, even better. All right, let's go. <laughs> How cool is this? Not only did I get to ride along with the Coast Guard, but I got a front row seat during an actual training drill. A standard search and rescue crew is made up of a rescue swimmer, a flight mechanic, a pilot, and a co-pilot. Depending on the situation, rescue swimmers can free fall from the helicopter or be lowered down via the rescue hook onto a boat or directly into the water. Swimmers deploy from helicopters for medical cases on cruise ships or tankers, and they also respond to boats taking on water or rescue people who are already in the water. I can't say enough about the swimmers. They're extremely well-trained, focused, and mentally tough. I suppose you have to be to jump out of a moving helicopter. It's the most widely used American military helicopter of all time and the icon of the Vietnam War. Its legacy continues to this day with the sounds of its blades still filling the skies. From taking a tour of the Huey at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum with the men who flew it, to riding along with the United States Coast Guard in the MH-60 Jayhawk, we've taken you behind the wings of the UH-1 Iroquois. Are you gonna shake my hand or not? Well, I thought about it, but... <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. You heard it. He'll never say a nice thing about me again. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Brilliant, buddy. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> <laughs>